For several weeks, I have been talking to us about their resources, our resources. I want to continue that thought today and probably outside of the passion of our Savior, what I want to talk to us about today is one of the most important messages of this series. It's a forgotten truth. And I want to take the basics of this thought today and try to drive it home to our hearts and our lives. Because the message today is the message that makes the difference between what kind of life we as Christians live. I want to talk to us today once again on the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. It's a forgotten truth in so many churches. It's a forgotten truth in so many lives. First of all, I want to deal with the basics. And I want to invite you once again to turn to the second chapter of the book of Acts. You know the first church, the first church was a, was a church that was victorious. I want to say it again. In every sense of the word, the early church was a victorious church. The more they persecuted that church, the stronger the church became. The more successful the church came, became. What was it that made the difference? Their resources, our resources. Join me, please, again in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, as we begin reading about what happened on the day of Pentecost. And I'll only read just a few verses so we can get right into the message. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly... There came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all of the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave him utterance. For those of you who might have missed our last message, other tongues, it's the word tongues there is the word translated tongues. It comes from the word language. It was not an unknown tongue. It was a known language. And if you read the chapter, you'll find at least 16 different nations gathered together there speaking multiple languages, and all of them heard the gospel in their own language. Now, what might have seemed to be unknown to one person was known to another person because everybody there heard the gospel in their own language. The word tongue there is the word language. Father, thank you for these moments we have, and I ask you now to help us to zone in on this truth. And we'll thank you for it because we ask in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. During our series of messages here on their resources, our resources, we have looked at the great ingredients of that great church. This was the church that was responsible for the continuation of the gospel and bringing the nation of Rome eventually to its knees. The Apostle Paul would write in one of his epistles, and he would state that there are saints in Caesar's household. And we noticed in chapter 1 of the book of Acts 
The thing that made the church great was the message, and that was the passion of the Lord Jesus. We notice, secondly, the thing that made them great was they did not keep that message silent. Jesus said, and you shall be witnesses, and that's exactly what they did. They went everywhere, the Bible says, from house to house, witnessing. They told everybody, everywhere they went, about the Lord Jesus. We notice the third great truth that made them great was they constantly lived in the expectancy of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus shall so come again in like manner as you have seen him go. It was also a church filled with a life of prayer. 120 of them are in an upper room praying when the Holy Spirit came. If you read through the book of Acts, you will notice that prayer uh, was not an obsolete part of their life. It was a complete part of their life in every situation, especially the dangerous situations. They pray and they seek the face of God. And then I talked to us about Acts 1 again, the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. He left them in their presence. They watched him as he ascended back to heaven. And there he sits even now as our great high priest. He is there uh, as our propitiation. He is there to hear our prayers. He is there to save the lost. He ever liveth, the Bible says, to make intercession for us. Then last week, I talked to us about the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, this could evolve into months and months of preaching. I don't intend to do that unless the Holy Spirit should guide me. But I do want to talk to us again today about the Holy Spirit of God. Now, there are extremes in the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Some people basic, basically ignore him. Others basically put all their attention, give all their attention to him. When I think about this subject, I think about the year 1961. History reminds us that 38 members of the Green Bay Packers arrived to begin a new year. The previous year had brought great defeat into uh, the lives of these players. The team had lost the last game of the year. They were greatly impacted by the loss. Now it's time for them to reassemble and to begin the, uh, the year of practice, which they hope will take them to the trophy shop when it's over. Their coach, one of the greatest coaches who's ever lived, Vince Lombardi, stepped forward to address his players for the upcoming year. The first thing he did was he held up a pigskin. <clears throat> he held up a football. And he looked at his players, and here's what he said. Gentlemen, this is a football. Now, remember, these guys, most of them had played in the previous year. Many of them had played for a number of years. But, but what he's trying to get them to understand, if we're going to be winners, we have to go back to the basics. Because they had lost the game, they had lost the trophy, they had lost the championship, he said, we're going to start with the elementary. We're going to go back and we're going to study the basics. And this is where we began. This is a football. And he taught them as if they'd never played a game previous to that moment. And they became winners. He was a great coach because he kept reminding them of the elementary. He kept reminding them of the basics. He kept reminding them of where they came from. Now, this morning, I'm going to be uh, preaching to a group of people, most of whom know everything I'm going to say to you this morning. But it's one thing to know it, and it's another thing to practice what we know. 
And we have to be put in remembrance of these things. Uh, that's what Peter said. Peter said, I'm going to soon be leaving you. But he said, before I go, I want to put you in remembrance of some things. I want to go back this morning and pick up the football. I want to go back this morning and get right back to the basics. And hopefully, just before I close the message today, I will get to the personal application of where I'm going with the message. But I want to begin by having you to follow me in the Scriptures. I don't want to just talk to you. I, I want you to see it. Uh, I want you, by the way, that's what we are. We are Bereans. The Bible said that the Bereans search the Scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Now, I can stand up here and tell you and talk to you and preach to you, and I'm going to do that. But I want you to see it in your Bible. We're going back to the very basics for just a few moments. And to do that, I want you to turn with me to the third chapter of the Gospel of John. John chapter number 3 in your Bibles. And uh, I want you to look with me at this great story of Nicodemus for just a moment. First of all, the, the purpose of the Holy Spirit is he is the attending agent to put us into the body of Jesus Christ at conversion. Now I want you to see this. I don't have time to elaborate on Nicodemus. You know the story. He came to Jesus by night. Jesus talked to him. He was a religious man, but he was a lost man. And I want you to note with me, we begin in verse number 3, if you will, of John chapter 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, you can put yourself in Mr. Nicodemus's place, and you could be very perplexed about that. Uh, how in the world, and Nicodemus raised the question, how can a man when he's old be born again? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus elaborates on that in verse 5. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now here, our Lord is talking about two births. Notice born of water. That is the first birth. Born of the Spirit is the second birth. Now there's a lot of controversy surrounding that verse of Scripture. There are people that have different ideas and different viewpoints of what he's saying. But I always want to allow the Bible to be its own commentary because the Lord knows better than anyone else what he's saying. And so we go to the Scripture and we find the commentary of these two births. And that's the next verse. Look with me again in verse 5. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The next verse is the commentary. That which is born of the flesh... That's the water birth. He's, he's, he's given us a commentary. Here's the explanation of the previous birth. Except a man be born of water. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Now that's the first birth. That's the water birth. That's what he's talking about. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. That's the second birth. The first birth gets us into this world. The second birth from above of the Spirit gets us in to heaven. Now, notice what he said. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. That is, if you want to go to heaven. Your first birth won't get you to heaven. Your first birth will send you to hell if you don't experience the second birth. The second birth is the birth of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God convicts us of our sin. We realize we're sinners. We realize He's the Savior. We realize that if we'll call upon His name, He will forgive us and He will save us. That is the second birth. The first birth introduces us to this world. The second birth introduces us to heaven. Uh, and, and there's so much again that needs to be said. 
the first birth that places within us a fallen nature. I'm going to say it again. The first birth places within us a fallen nature. We are a fallen race of people. Uh, somebody says, when I get to heaven, I'm going to slap Adam. Well, the good thing about getting to heaven is your nature is different there than it is here because you have a second birth. The first birth is a fallen birth. The first birth is a birth of separation. It separates us and God. The first birth is a birth of condemnation, John 3, 18. Bible says that we are already condemned because of our sin. Bible says we're outcasts. Uh, the Bible says we're alien to the commonwealth of Israel. We are lost. <clears throat> we live in this world and we come into this world like this world because we have a fallen nature. The reason people do sinful things is because they have a fallen nature. The reason people curse and lie and cheat and kill is because that's the nature of the first birth. But when we come and we're saved by the Spirit, He convicts us, we yield to the Lord, we ask Him to save us. The Holy Spirit is the attending physician there that makes it happen. Now, when we do that, Peter said that we are, at that time, we do at that time receive a divine nature. Are you listening? We receive a divine nature. We receive the nature of heaven. That's the reason Christians are different. Christians receive a nature that's characteristic of the city, the city of holiness to which we are going. That's the reason when we get saved, we become new creations in Christ Jesus. Hear me well, a life that has made a profession of faith but still only has the nature of this world and not a divine nature is a profession without reality. Because when we get saved, the Spirit of God gives us a new nature. We are imparted with divine life, the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. And a life that has made 10,000 professions of faith but has never changed is a false profession. The Holy Spirit of God is there when we get saved. Let me get you, I've got to move, as so much needs to be said, but let me get you to turn with me over to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter number 12, and here's another work of the Holy Spirit uh, when we get saved, 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, and I want to read to you verse number 13. For by one Spirit, and this gets right back to where we was at a moment ago, for by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jew or Gentile, whether we be bond or free, have been all made to drink uh, into one Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God is there. You find this in Acts chapter 2. The Bible said, John uh, baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. In Acts chapter 2, that, that body of believers, uh, they were placed into, baptized, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, the Bible says in the book of Ephesians, they were placed into the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the reason in the book of Corinthians, Paul uses the body as an illustration, the physical body as an illustration of what happens to us when we get saved. We are put in the body of Christ. And he said, just like this body is not one member, but this body is many members so also is the body of Christ. In this physical body, I see things like this, and I've told you this, but I, just for the sake of the message, uh, uh, this morning nobody got up, stood, and got, down, and got at the uh, breakfast table. If you ate breakfast uh, this morning, of course, you might have gone to the Golden Arches. I don't know. But uh, if you said it, even if you went to the Golden Arches this morning and you got a, a, an egg McMuffin uh, uh, or whatever you got, you, you never stopped. You, you probably bowed your head and you probably said, Lord, thank you for this uh, egg McMuffin. Thank you for this, these eggs. Thank you for the chicken that gave me the egg. Uh, thank you for the pig that gave me the sausage. Uh, Lord, thank you for the food that I've got in front of me. And then you said, amen. And then you started crunching it between your teeth. Now, if you didn't have an elbow, you couldn't have eaten it. God's give you an elbow. That's a part of your body. Try to eat with, a, with an arm like that. You'll kill the person next to you. 
you see the body is not one member, but it's many. We've got fingers that we can hold. We've got elbows that can bend our arms and knees and toes and ears and eyes and mouth. And uh, we've got all of these different parts of our body, but they, are, they all work together for one cause. That's the cause of the body. Now, he said the same thing's true of the church. There are people in the church. There are different gifts in the church. People have different responsibilities. There are, there are pastors and there are teachers and there are people that can sing. There are people that can minister. There are people that can pray for people. There are people that are given different gifts. He's talking about when we are placed into the body of Christ, we are placed there by the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, turn with me to, to the book of Ephesians. I want you to look at with me at uh, something else the Holy Spirit does. The book of Ephesians, chapter 4, and notice with me, please, verse number 30. Ephesians 4, 30. I love this one. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. Now, the Holy Spirit is there to place us in the body of Christ. And at the point of conversion... The Bible says that we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God. Notice what he says. Notice how long he says we're sealed. We're sealed until the day of redemption. What is the definition of the day of redemption? That is when we leave this world or the rapture takes place uh, and we step into the presence of the Lord. You see, uh, we're kept by the power of God unto salvation, but the Holy Spirit of God is the seal placed upon that conversion that guarantees safe delivery. Years ago, I was a service manager at a place of business, and I purchased a lot of product. And I, on one occasion, I flew to the city of Chicago, and I went into this place, and we loaded a, uh, we loaded a, a trailer uh, with the product I was purchasing, and and uh, I flew back to Winston-Salem or Greensboro, and, uh, and the next day, that product we loaded uh, backed up to the dock in the city of Winston-Salem. But before I left Chicago, I stood there, and I watched the company put seals on the back door of that trailer. What did that mean? That simply meant that the, that the company who owned that tractor-trailer guaranteed that product would arrive in Winston-Salem with not one piece of that product missing. That seal guaranteed the product. That seal says the company who owns this trailer guarantees you that that product will arrive safely in the city of Winston-Salem. The moment you and I got saved, we are sealed, 430 of Ephesians, by the Holy Spirit of God. What's it about? It guarantees us uh, that everyone who has entered the arena of conversion, redemption, and salvation uh, will at last, through death or the rapture, uh, stand in the presence of God, and the Trinity of the Godhead stands behind that seal to guarantee safe delivery into the presence of the Lord. You say, well, preacher, I hope to get to heaven. If you're saved, the seal of the Holy Spirit guarantees safe delivery. You say, preacher, I'm holding on. That's like saying to Noah when he finished the ark, it's like God saying to Noah, I'm going to drive some pegs on the outside of this ark, and you and your family grab a hold of those pegs, and you hold on while this ark floats through the carn of all of the death of the human race and all of the animals and all of the water and all of the storms. You, you try to endure to the end. It's like God saying, I hope you arrive on Mount Ararat later, so hold on and do the best you can do. That's what some people are trying to do. God didn't tell them to hold on to something on the outside. When it came time for the water to, uh, to descend and the floods to begin, uh, he said, the Bible said that they got in and God shut the door uh, 
And for all of those days, uh, they were safe inside of the ark, not holding on to the outside. The safety was on the inside. When you get saved, you're in Christ. Uh, and the safety is not us trying. Uh, it is what the Lord Jesus Christ has provided for us. Uh, the seal of the Holy Spirit has the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit behind it, behind it guaranteeing safe arrival uh, when we reach heaven's shore. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Now, if you're saved, here's the next thing the Holy Spirit does. And I want you to see this in your Bibles. I want you to see it. I want you to read it. Uh, and that is the residence of the Holy Spirit. If you're saved, a person, a person, hear me well. If you're saved, the person of the Holy Spirit who placed the seal there, who puts you in the body of Christ, the person of the Holy Spirit indwells you. He lives within you. Let me prove it to you. Turn with me, please, to the book of 2 Timothy, Jackie. Amen. Turn with me, please, to the book of 2 Timothy. I didn't want you to end up in 1 Timothy, Jackie. Now, amen, I knew that. God. Now, here we go. 2 Timothy 1.14. <laughs> I want you to notice 2 Timothy 1.14. 2 Timothy 1.14. Everybody got it. I want you to see this. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in you. Do you see that? If you are saved, who dwelleth in you? Let's say it again. If you're saved, who dwelleth in you? The Holy Spirit. Now, that's what the Bible says. I'm going to take the Bible for it, aren't you? Now, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. You was there? Let's go back. You're learning your Bibles today. Your Bible's getting the best workout it's had all week. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3 and verse number 16. I like 316. 1 Corinthians 3. 16, listen to what Paul said to the church of Corinth. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God. What is a temple? The building. Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Do you see that? Listen to my next statement. In the Old Testament, God lived in a temple, a building made by hands. In the New Testament, God lives in a body, your body, my body. That's what he says right here, 1 Timothy 3, 6. Know you not that you're the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Look at two things there. The temple, a building. In the, tabernacle, in the wilderness, there was the tabernacle. The Shekinah glory, the day of atonement, came down once a year. Solomon's temple, you read the story in the Old Testament. When they dedicated Solomon's temple, the presence of God came. And it was so, the presence of God was so real in the building that the priests were, were unable to minister. Watch this closely. The presence of God in the tabernacle. The presence of God in the temple. Where's the third temple that God manifested himself in? In the person of Jesus Christ. 2,000 years ago, the incarnation, God moved into a temple, a human temple. He was God in very God, very flesh. As much God if he were not man, as much man if he were not God. God came among us. Uh, the Word was made flesh, John said, and dwelt among us. Tabernacle, temple, the temple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now where is God living? In the body of the believer. Right now, if you are saved, you are indwelled with the Holy Spirit of God. You're in the book of 1 Corinthians. Move over to the 6th chapter, and let me show it to you again. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And notice with me, please, if you will, verse number 19. Now, this is vitally important. Listen to what Paul said. He raised the question, what 
Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God, watch this, in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Notice what he said. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. Do you get it? In you. If you're saved, he lives in you. Many years ago, a preacher was uh, on vacation. He went to England. He and his wife decided to go to Buckingham Palace. They are waiting for the changing of the guard. And while he's standing there waiting for the changing of the guard, he said to his wife, uh, I wonder how you understand, I wonder how you determine if the queen is in uh, the palace. A person who lived there overheard the conversation. And the person said to the preacher, uh, oh, I can answer that question for you. When the queen is in the palace, uh, the flag is flying full mast. If the, if, if the queen's not in her residence, the flag is not flying. Oh, if you want to know if the queen's in, just look up and see if the flag's flying. You want to know if the Holy Spirit lives within you? Well, you don't have to worry about it because the Lord Jesus Christ said, when he is come, he will abide with you forever. The flag of the Holy Spirit flies over your soul to say that the Holy Spirit is in present residence in your body. Now, he's there. Now, I want to turn to the book of Ephesians, and uh, I want you to see another passage of Scripture, and then we're going to turn back to the Gospel of John. I want to make the personal application, begin it personally. I, I want you to see this. Uh, now that the Holy Spirit is living within us, hear me well, he desires to find expression through us. Hear me well. If you're saved, it's been determined, I prove to you, the Holy Spirit lives within you. Listen, listen to me closely. My time's gone, but listen to me closely. The great tragedy of this hour, right now, right this very minute, in Christianity is that too many people who are professing faith in the Lord Jesus Christ are trying to live the Christian life in the flesh and not in the spirit. I want to tell you something. If you depend on you to be an overcoming Christian, you're going down in defeat. If you depend on you uh, to be a super abundant Christian, uh, you'll never make it. Uh, Paul had to write to the church of Corinth, and here's what he said. Uh, he said, uh, I could not write unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Why? Because here were some people who had made a profession of faith but they were not living according to the leadership of the Holy Spirit in their life. They were living on the natural level like unsaved people. And he said, you're carnal. He said, I couldn't even talk to you on spiritual level because you're not capable of receiving it. He said, hey, I couldn't even fellowship with you on a spiritual level because you're not able to receive it. Uh, listen to me. The best day in your life, hear me well, the best day in your life after you get saved is the day when you turn your life over to the Holy Spirit of God and allow God to give you strength, allow God to give you boldness, uh, allow God to fill you with his presence so that you don't depend on the flesh, but rather you depend on the Spirit of God to live a powerful, overcoming, testimonial life for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. And 90 plus percent of the Christians don't know, know nothing about that. And what I've just said to multitudes of people, don't even register because people don't understand the person and the work of the Holy Spirit of God. But he's there ready to be activated in your life if you want to be an overcoming Christian. Look at Ephesians, please. Notice with me in the fifth chapter, verse number 18. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, 
but be filled with the Spirit. The need of this hour is for Christians to direct their lives to the Holy Spirit of God so that they can be filled with His power and with His presence. It's in the Bible. I just showed it to you. Now, He gives here two contrasts. The contrast of wine and the contrast of being filled with the Holy Spirit. Both of which, hear me well, both of which require an individual to do something to get the end results of what's stated. For instance, be not drunk with wine. Nobody takes a gun, puts it to your head, and says to you, drink this alcohol. Nobody does that. In order for you to get intoxicated, you have to make a decision. I'm going to the ABC store. I'm going to the grocery store. I'm going to take hard-earned hard money and buy some poison. I'm going to drink the poison. I mean, you, you make the decision to buy the alcohol. You make the decision to bring it home. I was at a grocery store not long ago. I seen a guy came out. I kind of felt like he was a church member. The way he was looking in the parking lot is he's carrying his six pack out. He can't, I, I noted, he got out, he got in his truck, and I could tell he was fumbling around. I knew what he was doing. He was opening up the package. And sure enough, out comes a can, a poison, and he sits there in his truck, and he's drinking that. Now look, nobody made him do that. That was a personal choice. <laughs> personal choice. I, I got a thousand things going through my mind. I got, let me share. I, I told this church this years ago. I want you to hear this again. It fits in right here. I was pastoring a church years ago. I happened to be over in uh, Mount Airy. And I was coming down 601 South. And at that time, they didn't sell poison in Yadkin County. They've since put up an ABC store. But uh, there was a man, uh, by the way, on the other side of the river, on the Mount Airy side of the river, there was a package store. You have to come around this curve just before you cross the river, and they had a drive through at the back. I don't know why they didn't have it in the front. They had a drive through in the back. And this man had uh, driven to the back. He'd got his poison, and he, and he turned out, and just so happened, as I came around the curb, he pulled out in front of me. Well, it just so happened, I knew him to be one of my church members. And for some reason, I felt divinely impressed to get on his bumper. And I got right up behind him. And he's, he's done opened up the container, and he's guggling it down, and and uh, I, I'm watching him in the side view mirror. I can see him doing it. I wanted him to know that it's not going to settle on your stomach well because you're going to see the preacher here in just a minute. I pulled over almost on the center line so he could see me. And he started up like that, and he looked in his mirror, and he done like that. He looked like he had just seen Casper the Friendly Ghost. The next thing I see him doing is he's raising up in his seat and he's doing that. He's putting all that stuff behind him because he knows. He knows the preacher well enough to know. The preacher's going to eventually, whenever he lands, the preacher's going to pull up beside of him and ask him how he's doing. And he tries to hide all of that. And sure enough, I followed him to the destination where I would have normally gone on. I just followed him. I followed him all the way home. Much to his detriment, I pulled up. I was as nice to him as I. I didn't have to say anything. I was just nice to him. He knew I had him. He never said anything. I said, "Hey, brother, how you doing?" Oh, I'm doing fine. Lying through his teeth, he's scared to death. But that man made a conscious decision from his home to drive about uh, 
uh, he drove about eight miles to pick up his poison. He drove eight miles back. He put it in his mouth. That was a conscious decision he made himself. Be not drunk with wine, where is access, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Just as you have to make a conscious decision to put alcohol in your body, you have to make a conscious decision that I don't want to live a substandard Christian life. I don't want to live a defeated Christian life. I want to make sure that I've got everything that God wants me to have I desire that, I want that, and I'm going to come before God, and I'm going to say to the Lord, Lord, I want it. I want the best you've got for me. I don't want to be a substandard Christian. I don't want to be a Christian walking around never in and never out and just kind of lukewarm and, and, and never doing it my full potential, never living up to my full potential. Lord, I want the fullness of the Holy Spirit of God. When we get serious enough about it, God will grant that request, and God will give us the fullness of his Holy Spirit. And I want to show you how. It's time to go. i got five minutes or less when I usually get through preaching. I'm not through. I will stop. I will unhook the boxcar shortly, but I want you to turn with me to John chapter 7. Here the Lord Jesus Christ gives us the prescription. The prescription. John chapter number 7, and notice with me hurriedly, John chapter number 7, and notice verse number 37. John chapter 7, verse number 37. Now, let me, let me give you the setting. Look in John chapter 7, verse number 2. Now the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles was in hand. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles was where the Jews, they came to Jerusalem for uh, the Passover, and one of the feasts was the Feast of Tabernacles. They lived in booths. There's probably over a million people in Jerusalem. And they lived in booths for seven days. It was a reminder of what they lived in in the wilderness after they left Egypt. God told them, I don't you ever forget what happened down there. So for seven days, they live in these booths, Feast of Tabernacles. And it was a time of jubilation because it happened just about this time of the year when they got their crops in. And it was a time of praise because the Lord blessed their crops. They're able to put their crops in. They're able to, uh, now they've kind of got their crops in. They're able to rest a little bit. And so they're rejoicing. They've got their crops in. It's a time of celebration. It's a time of celebrating the Passover. And uh, they just, they've met there in Jerusalem and they are living in these booths. On the seventh day of this event, the priest and a group of people would take some golden vessels. They would go down to the pool of Siloam. They would fill the golden vessels in the, uh, with water, and they would bring those golden vessels back up to the temple. Beside of the brazen altar, there's a place where they deposit that water. And as they come back towards the temple, the priest and the people are singing from the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, let him come to the, the, to the waters and drink. And that's what that's their theme. They're singing it on the way back, seven times around the city. They're bringing the, the water back, golden vessels, put it in the silver vessels. They come inside the temple. They put the water over there beside of the brazen altar, and they're singing, Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, let them come to the water and drink. Now, with that setting, watch this. Look at John chapter 7, verse 37. In the last day... That great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried. Now, when you see the word cried there, it's not someone speaking with tears coursing down their, their face. The word cried there is a word which means someone would make this statement at the top of their voice. The Son of God is speaking as loud as he knows how to speak. There's a crowd of people there. And so if Jesus said to them, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Now notice, he's making a comparison. 
They put that water there beside the brazen altar because usually this time of the year in Jerusalem there was drought, wasn't a lot of water. So with millions of people there, if they're up there at the temple worshiping, they provide water there beside of the brazen altar. And so uh, Jesus looks at the crowd who are thirsty and he says to them in the midst, watch it now, he's using an illustration. He's going somewhere with this. He stood up with a loud voice. He said, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now watch the next verse. He gives us a understanding, the commentary of what he's saying. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him, watch this, future tense, should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. What's he saying? Hear me well. There are two things. There's many things I could say, but it's time to go. Two things. Number one, if you want the best God has for you, there has to be a thirst to get it. Notice what he said. If any man thirst, I want to ask you a question. Do you have a desire to get closer to God? Now, if you don't, it don't apply to you. If you're satisfied the way you are, then it don't apply to you. But if you're saved, I would hope you're not satisfied where you're at. I would hope you would want more of him. If any man thirst, if you are hungry for the presence and the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit on your life, and you're not satisfied with a slipshod life, you're not satisfied with the level you're living on because your life is full of fretting, your life is full of worry, your life is, is filled with the secular, your life is not as close to the Lord as it used to be, and you know you're missing something. You know God has something better for you. You know that you're just not satisfied with the type of Christian life you're living. If you are thirsting for more, then God has something to quench your thirst and that is the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit upon your life. But notice, please, not only is there the thirst, there's the invitation. If you thirst, let him come. There's the invitation. He's talking about the Holy Spirit that should be given. Let him come. Let him come. The Bible talks about the invitations that were sent out for the Great Supper. You remember? They sent the servants out and they began to make excuse. They decided they didn't want filet mignon. They decided they didn't want steak. You know what they wanted? They wanted to sit at home and open up a can of pork and beans and a pack of crackers. They had a lot more available to them, but they chose. They chose to miss the supper. Most Christians will live their lives and choose to miss the best that God has for them. Well, my friend, I'm reminded of old Bud Robertson. But tongue-tied, Nazarene, preacher Bud Robinson. He said, man, I tried to get everything God had for me. He said, I looked in the Bible and I noticed that God said he would fill us. He said, I tried everything I knew to get filled with the Holy Spirit. He said, I took my deck of cards and placed it on the altar. But he said, I didn't get it. He said, I put my Presbyterian mother on the altar, but I didn't get it. He said, I put my mule on the altar, and I didn't get it. He said, I put a bell of hay on the altar, and I didn't get it. He said, man, I tried everything I had trying to get the fullness of what God wanted for me. He said, I wanted it so bad. He said, I wanted the presence and the power of God. He said, finally, when I just give up and said, Lord, it's not I but you. I want what you've got, whatever it costs me, whatever I have to do. I don't want to live just a normal life. I want to live a life with the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit of God upon my, read the book of Acts over and over and over again. He said, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. What happened when they got filled with the Holy Spirit? And they spoke, spake the word of God boldly. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you won't be a spiritual anemic. You'll have power to stand up. I love to think back about when the lady in the North Carolina legislature told me I couldn't pray in Jesus' name. 
Finally, I said, I, if I pray, I pray in his name. I can see the Speaker of the House right now looking at me, trying to introduce me. He hated like everything to introduce me. He knew I was going to pray in Jesus' name. Amen, he knew the rest of the week he was going to keep me out, but he let me pray that one night since I drove the distance. What enabled me to stand? I'm not bragging about me. I'm bragging about the whole Spirit of God. You know how I could stand up there under so much opposition in the North Carolina legislature and pray in the name of Jesus? The Spirit of God anointed me. Man, I wasn't, I wasn't afraid of Godzilla. Whoever that is. We need the boldness of the Holy Spirit of God upon our lives to do effectively the work that God called us to do. Do you have a desire to get closer to God? Do you have a desire to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you have a desire to have the boldness of God? Remember, it's a personal decision, just like drinking alcohol. You have to make a personal decision to do it. If you want God on your life, you want to be filled with, you need to come and ask God today. Lord, I don't want to live just a normal slipshod. I want everything you've got for me. If we come and claim it, I can promise you God's word said he'll give it to you. 